Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Josh Long. Based in San Francisco, Josh is a developer advocate for the Spring Framework at Pivotal. A popular conference speaker and creator of, of some pretty great screencasts, he is also the author or co-author of over six books, including the O'Reilly book, Cloud Native Java, Designing Resilient Systems with Spring Boot. You can learn more about Josh on his website, joshlong.com. Subscribe to his podcast, A Bootiful Podcast, on Apple uh, Podcasts and anywhere else you find podcasts. And you can follow him on Twitter at Starbucks Man, and that's Starbucks with an X. Joss is the author of the LeanPub book, Re- Reactive Spring. In the book, Joss introduces uh, readers to the implementation of reactive programming in the Spring ecosystem. In this interview, we're going to talk about Josh's background and career, professional interests, uh, Spring and reactive programming in his book, and at the end, we'll talk a little bit about his experience as an author. So thank you, Josh, for being on the LeanPub Front Matter podcast. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you first became interested in technology. Sure. So uh, I am from uh, Los Angeles, California, uh, a, uh, a sprawling city in the southern part of California. And uh, there I um, I was lucky enough to have – I'm kind of – I'm 35, so I, I'm a, of the generation where computers were – starting to proliferate in, in, in the schools and, and so on. And so, you know, in public schools, so they were like, you know, you, you didn't have to be blessed to get access to a computer. And, um, and so I, I, I got to play with them a lot and, you know, I was pretty interested in graphics and, uh, how do you get, um, you know, how do you automate some of the things that we did in the, in the analog world, you know, and that eventually led me to, to, um, programming long story. Circumlocutously, I ended up programming calm on windows to automate certain tasks that I was doing, right? And um, from there, it was a long, dizzying array of other languages, and I uh, worked at a number of different startups and uh, found one technology that was particularly useful, and I got pretty good at it, and not great at it, mind you, but okay, right? And then uh, and then here we are. Somebody somebody hired me, the company uh, Spring, the Spring team, they hired me uh, because of my familiarity with that technology. Um, one question that comes up, often on uh-huh. this podcast because so many people uh, that we interview are, um, you know, in software engineers and in careers like that is, um, did you study computer science formally at university or college? Nope. Nope. I, um, I've been doing it since I was young, uh, early teens. Right. So I, I just, I've just been very lucky. And, and then I, I mean, I did, I did start down a path, but I never finished studying it, uh, formally cause I was sort of, I didn't need to. Uh, there, I was able to get a job. I was able to be a, be productive in in the uh, in, in in industry. Uh, and that's not to say that that's all people's. That should be all people's path. Quite the contrary. I think I think uh, you you should never discredit the value of a good education. That said, uh, I was lucky, and that is the right word, lucky, that I didn't didn't need it to be able to land on my feet. But um, when you say you were you lucky, know, do you mean you were lucky that you got your first job, even though you didn't have have a degree or? No, I mean, uh, sure, sure, but I mean, more to the point, I was I was lucky that I was able to acquire the skills that would make me qualified for the first job that I got, right? Uh, and then I wouldn't have been able to acquire those had a, a, a string of things happened. First of all, computers had to be cheap enough that my dad could bring one into the house for his private little his personal business, you know, his uh, his small home business, um, and I could tinker with that. I, I wouldn't have been able to get good at, at computers if the public school systems didn't have one or two of them sitting in classrooms in Los Angeles in the early nineties. Uh, um, in some classrooms, I can't speak to all of them, but the ones I was lucky enough to be in, um, I wouldn't have had the opportunity, uh, you know, had anybody discouraged me or actively gone another way to make it so that I, I didn't get a chance to use that computer. Cause I was pretty, I was easily cowed, you know, I, I wouldn't have wanted to make people unhappy or whatever. So I, I remember my dad, um, had this really nice laser printer he used for invoices and these kinds of things. And it was a laser printer. And I remember trying to print the slides or the, the notes for a presentation I was going to do on a screen projector uh, in class. And it was, a, you know, it's a, you used to have plastic slides that you'd put on top of a screen projector. Well, of course I'm an idiot. So I put this, this plastic slide oh, no. into a, la- into a laser printer and I try and print and, and, and you know what? That first page, first half of that page came out just fine but uh the rest of it melted inside the printer so uh <laughs> no. like yeah it wasn't great and again now my dad could have been my dad could have gone 
either way, and he, you know, he could have been very angry with me and been completely uh, upset with me, which would have been completely reasonable, especially given how expensive uh, a laser printer, I guess, would have cost at the time, you know. Um, but he didn't. And it's interesting. Do you do you? Um, so, for example, you know, I grew up. I'm I'm a little bit older than you, but I grew up. I uh, you know, with I, I still have memories of the first computer that came into the house and that being a special yeah. event. Um, but I never personally got interested in programming. Do you remember what it was that got you interested in that? For a lot of people, for example, it's making making a game or just some. So they they see a parent doing some coding and then they they sort of get hooked. Yeah, it was so. Um, isn't this weird? I I have. My mom has a, uh, or had, rest in peace. She had a, a, a dear friend named Baba Lee, and Baba Lee was in the late '80s. Uh, she was the technical support person for our family, right? She'd come over, and she had a family and kids of her own. But she'd come over and she'd help my dad with his computer, right? And uh, she, sh- her work was that she spent time writing documentation for technical software, right? She was a documentation writer for software. And uh, she was using something called, Vin, uh, called uh, Ventura, right? It's it's now owned by Corel, but it used to be, if you wanted to do a long document publication, then you did it on specialized software. So Adobe, it used to be called Aldous Frame Maker, um, or maybe it was Frame, I think uh, it was the Frame Maker and then eventually became Aldous and then Adobe Frame Maker, right? Um, and there's another one called uh, called Ventura and that's known by Corel now. And she used that quite a bit. And so I was fascinated by this idea that there's a discrepancy between the way you, like I, you know, I learned to use uh, Borland Word Perfect, right? And then that became um, Novell, right? And I, I, I was was fascinated by the idea that there's this discrepancy between the way the thing you would use to write a document, a book, a page, a, a study, whatever, uh, versus the way you would actually design a document, right? Like a a long document with like a like an encyclopedia or a catalog or a whatever and so that sent me down this rabbit trail where i was just trying to soak up anything i could learn about um design software right i i, I don't know and eventually i discovered you could actually automate this stuff right so if you wanted to take these tools that were purpose-built for long document publication if you wanted to really make them do interesting things you'd have to connect them to a database right and so i ended up going into this um sort of C++ and Visual Basic world with Visual Studio 6. And uh, uh, that was fun. But by that point, I had learned Python and I had learned Java. And I was at Java, I couldn't figure out how to make that work with Calm. But there was something called, there was something called Python, a nice, very nice programming language called Python. And you could use that to talk to Calm, right? And so I just remember being very fascinated with uh, that possibility in the sort of mid to end of 90s. And... Um, you know, I had done other stuff before. And of course, at the time, contemporaneous with all that, there's the web and JavaScript and, you know, PHP. And you learn about, I did CGI and C code. I did bash, you know, trying to, trying to set up servers, these kinds of things. So it all just kind of fell on me by accident. And then uh, away we went. Yeah. Thanks a lot for sharing that. It's, it's, it's um, so interesting to hear the different ways people uh, get into, get into programming. And it's often a mix, it, it's a, a mixture of timing and home life and even geography. Often um, I've interviewed people where, you know, being, being very isolated is what led them to, yeah. to computing. Um, uh, so one of the more fun features of this podcast is that I get to interview people from all around the world. And one of the things I'd like to ask them about, or two of the things I'd like to ask them about is what's the tech sector like where you are? And the other one is often the person might have local knowledge of something that the rest of us have read about in the headlines that I can ask about. And so I'm not going to ask you about what the tech sector is like like in San Francisco, because I think we all... What what tech sector? Well, I mean, normally when I'm asking this question, it's it's for people well, yeah. in places where there's it's there's not really all that much going on. So it's a there's no, there's nothing going on here, my friend. Yeah, nothing. That's, that's, that's what I've heard. It's a wasteland. Nothing but, going on. Um, it is a wasteland. Yeah. But but one thing um, that people probably have read about is homelessness in San Francisco. Um, yep. And I was wondering if you wouldn't be willing to talk a little bit about about that yourself. Is this something that you encounter day to day? And what do you think makes it such a hard problem to address? Well, uh, good question. So there, we, I live in San Francisco, right? And so San Francisco, strictly speaking, uh, uh, is far away from Silicon Valley. But because of the sort of soaring prices of that, that area there, we see a, a lot of people moving into San Francisco that would have otherwise just been 
happy to live in Silicon Valley. So it's weird to think of so, uh, San Francisco as being the cheap place to live, but it is, right? The actual, the, the, because there's not a lot of, um, because of the, there is this sort of uh, burgeoning tech sector ish. By the way, I, I, uh, I'm not really all that impressed with the Silicon Valley sort of tech sector, just between you and me and your listeners. I've always sort of wondered what we could do if we put our minds to things, you know, but, um, and, and, and I speak to technology users all around the world every year, you know, 600,000 plus miles a year on planes, talking to people in six out of the seven continents. Uh, people are amazing everywhere. And, uh, I, I, I reject this idea that there's anything part- intrinsically interesting about Silicon Valley. The only thing I don't, the only thing you'll find that's unique to Silicon Valley is that they think they're the only ones doing this stuff, right? Which is preposterous. Um, but because there is this sort of aura of, uh, of, uh, you know, of, of excellence or whatever, people think they're, they're excellent here. Uh, there's this influx of people that go to Silicon Valley for jobs. And of course, it's very expensive in the cities that surround Silicon Valley. Because remember, these were all little suburbia. This is all cities that were, that were, that sprouted out, um, uh, a long time ago, and they weren't meant to be like full on uh, cities. They were just little bed and breakfast communities. And eventually, uh, these giant these giant companies started forming out of out of garages, you know, in the region. And so they set up their campuses, they set up their little headquarters nearby. And um, so that's still very true. These giant campuses, you know, you've got the Googles, the VMwares, the Facebooks, the uh, the, the the whatever Apple. All these companies are in what are otherwise very boring areas of of California. There's nothing. They're just flat. There's no skyscrapers. There's, there's nothing there, right? It's it's nice blue skies, but th- these cities don't want to be major burgeoning metropolises. They don't want skyscrapers. They don't want an airport. You know, all that kind of stuff. So, as a result, um, the prices of of things down there, uh, since there's a lot less uh, supply and an and increasingly greater amount of demand, the prices of homes in Silicon Valley have skyrocketed, uh, and that has pushed people to the fringes. And when I say the fringes, I mean San Francisco, um, which is a little weird to think about, right? Even even some of the tech companies have, uh, re, you know, they set up satellite offices here in San Francisco just to accommodate people who, who'd rather live here where it's a, cheaper or maybe they just prefer the, the locale or whatever. Um, and so, you know, we have now a growing population of people here in San Francisco. Uh, and there's also a good deal of, uh, a good, good many people who are buying as sort of a speculative investment instruments here in San Francisco, right? And so, you know, there's a uh, there's a, a large number of people who are buying from overseas, right? They're trying to move money out of the auspices of their sort of respective governments. So they they use uh, real estate here in in the Bay Area uh, as a as an instrument, so to speak. So both of these things are contributing to a situation where we've got sort of artificial inflation in real estate here. I think San Francisco is a nice place, but uh, it's not, it's not that nice, right? There's something else pushing the price up uh, beyond its intrinsic sort of value. The results of this um, uh, has been, unfortunately, that people that could otherwise afford to live here can't, and also because we are very tied to uh, the sort of ebb and flow of the economy, because you know nobody wants a new iPhone when you can't afford your mortgage, right? So, so we we have a lot of people that. Oh, and also we're a fast-moving sort of industry, so we have a lot of people that are just sort of being phased out of um, out of their industry. I just it's hard to pick one particular thing, but for whatever reason, uh, and I and I expect that tech is a big part of it, but it's not the only part of it. For whatever reason, there's a lot of people here that uh, are on the streets, right? And that's um, it, in absolute numbers, it's not a huge number, right? It, I think what is San Francisco more than it's just a little bit more than a million people, I guess. Uh, last I heard, last I had heard, I haven't I haven't checked. So we're not a huge number, um, but because San Francisco is only seven miles by seven miles, you're going to be confronted by that number every day, right? You're going to see people on the streets. You can't. There's no place you can sort of go to to sort of avoid them. They're just they're just there, right? And that's just you know it's just a, a daily reminder because it's a very small small uh, city. Uh, Los Angeles, where I come from, on the other hand, has a real homeless population problem, right? Uh, every night, no, sorry, every year, there's about two hundred fifty thousand people. That and it's not the same people. It's you know different people sometimes. So uh, it's not two hundred fifty thousand. Dis- it's not. It's it's two hundred fifty thousand people that have slept on the street at one point or another, but not all year, right? Um, every year there's two hundred fifty thousand or so people in Los Angeles that 
sleep on the streets in, in LA, which is crazy. It, that's a quarter of the population of San Francisco, if you think about it, right? We don't have anything close to that. I, I reckon the number is closer to you know, 10,000 at, at the highest or whatever. Maybe I could be wrong, but it's not very high um, uh, here in San Francisco. So the homeless people are, I think most of the time you're gonna find they're pretty harmless, right? There's two types of homeless people as far as I can tell. Uh, and, and I've had, I've had incidences with, uh, homeless people here in San Francisco. I'm sure everybody can give you a story where they've seen somebody, um, you, you know, avail themselves of the street for, to go to the bathroom or something like that. You know, it's just really sad because there's two kinds of homeless people here. Basically there's, there's, there's the, the first kind, which is basically like you and me, right? We could have one bad month. Our company could fold. Uh, we could lose our job. We couldn't. We could just. We're living in an overpriced uh, residence, and we can't afford to make the mortgage for a couple months. And then, uh, and uh, one thing leads to another, and we're next thing we're no. Next thing we're no. We're sleeping in our in our cars. But of course, we're. You know, it's hard to get a job. Whatever cascade of bad bad things. Uh, and the next thing you know, six months you're on the street, right? Um, and that could happen to a lot of people, right? And the and the and when the when the when the economy recessed in two thousand eight. That happened to a lot of people, right? Happens to a lot of people all the time, and it's and it's just awful because, you know, these people are not. Nobody chooses to be homeless, or very very few people choose to be homeless. These are people that they, they deserve dignity. They, they deserve our help. You know, they they deserve to 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 prosper as the rest of us do. But uh, just a series of bad luck, you know. And so these are people that don't want to be there, and given the opportunity, um, a lot of them would would happily sort of. Uh, get out of there if they could. And the other kind of homeless person is the, the kind that um, I would say maybe need help, right? Uh, these are people that are uh, maybe in the throngs of a drug addiction, right? And they can't help themselves. Or maybe they've got some sort of issue, some sort of health issue, and they can't help, help themselves. And so in which case, we should definitely help them, right? These are people that can't help themselves for whatever reason. So we can't help them either. So it's just really sad. I mean, the whole the homeless situation just it kills people like me because I mean, it, I mean, sure it kills anybody who thinks about it for a minute it, it, because these are people, both classes of people, want, they can't help themselves or they want to help themselves if they, if they could. And if they can't help themselves, it's not because they don't want to, it's just because they don't know that they should, you know? Um, so yeah, it's a really, it's a sort of, I think as much as the fact that we've got these two pretty bridges is things that, you know, these are two things that people identify San Francisco for. I think the homeless thing, it's, um, it's a tragic marker of our, of our, of our small little city. And, you know, I don't know how to fix it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for that great explanation. Um, uh, and in particular for, you know, drawing attention to the relative size of the problem for so many people in, in Los Angeles compared to San Francisco. That number is per year. So it's not the same, like on any given night, it's maybe 80,000 or something like that. It's much smaller, but still, you know, way, way, it's heads and tails way, way bigger in absolute numbers than, than San Francisco. It's bigger in percentages too, right? It's just a, um, it's not the same thing. It's just that we are confronted with it here. In, in, in Los Angeles, it can take you hours and hours and hours just to get from one side of the city to the other. So right. you can, there's like Skid Row where, where all the people are in tents and encampments. Uh, and that's just kind of out of the way, right? If you're in Beverly Hills, you're not going to see these people in tents very much, you know? It's, it's entirely possible to live a life where you never see homeless person if you want to right um whereas in san francisco it's just it's so small it's so small you can walk the whole thing in a few hours you know yeah it's uh i've i've been to san francisco a few times and i've had i've had similar experience to the ones you 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 mentioned thanks thanks a lot for sharing that my next question as we approach talking about uh the work that you do at at pivotal or for pivotal um is about traveling so you travel a lot uh, yes sir. i believe recently you were just in spain yes well uh yeah where was i spain 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 yeah i came back on thursday from spain that sounds right okay okay great i'm glad i got that right um and uh and I, I lived uh, in the UK myself for a few years and traveled around Europe a bit. And even though I'm a Canadian, because of my accent, I know a little bit about what it's like to be treated as an American when you're traveling abroad. <laughs> um, okay. And I was wondering if you've noticed a change in the kind of questions you're asked when you're abroad now, or in the way that people relate to you when they find out or think you're you're American. 
Oh, interesting question. Um, yeah. So I, I had 2016 was a strange year. I, I, I presume you're referring to a, the recent change of government. Um, yeah, yeah. And just, just, to give little, affect us. just to give a little bit of context, um, I started, I moved to the UK in 1999, but I started uh, university there doing a doctorate in um, October 2001. Yeah. Oh. And so it was a, it was a very charged time. Yes. Uh, particularly sure. with respect to, you know, being American, and that that was actually it was thinking about that experience that led me to ask you to. It, that's why it occurred to me to ask you about this. Yeah. I. Uh, so. Okay. So. If you get into a taxi, uh, or an Uber or whatever it is, my taxi or Yandex or whatever. Um, or DD, and if they speak, if they if if somebody's talkative, um, in most of Western Europe, uh, if they're talkative in Asia, and if they speak the language, one of the languages that I speak, then, uh, you know, if somebody detects that I want to, that I'm interested in, or that I'm not in the middle of something, let's put it that way. If I'm not in the middle of something, and they're feeling talkative, the conversation will in in inevitably sort of when it's way to politics. Right. And, um, so yeah, people are, people are, people in the UK, as you know, are frustrated by Brexit. And, uh, and I think over there, there's, um, a, a bit of sympathy that they feel for those of us going through the, uh, uh, through the current government. Right. In, in 2016, a lot of the people on the tech circuit, a lot of the people that are speakers out there, like myself, I, I tend to lean, I'm pretty uh, progressive, you know, I wouldn't call myself conservative. And um, I think that's, I think it's pretty fair to say that a lot of the people that I tend to frequently see uh, on the circuit, uh, they tend to lean left of center uh, as well. So when we see each when we saw each other for the first time after 2016, after, uh, after November, I just remember all my European friends and all my friends from South America and my friends from Asia, all of them were just, they were just like, they came over to me like somebody had died. You know, it was very, it was, it was the most surreal thing. And I, and I, and it was, I was in a, I remember the election happened and then we got on, I got on a plane and I had to go somewhere. But then like four or five countries later, I was in uh, Belgium for this, this amazing conference called DevOx. And there, that's the, that's one of the bigger sort of Java sphere conferences, you know, and there I was, I just saw dozens of people who wanted, who came to me like they wanted to talk, like they wanted to offer me sympathy, condolences or sympathies or something like that. It was surreal. And it was the same sort of sense that we had right after Brexit, right? Uh, a lot of people were just like shell shocked. They couldn't believe that that had happened. They'd gone to bed and woken up to a completely different world. So yeah, that, that is different. It's, it's funny you say that about waking up in a different world. Um, for people listening who might not know, American elections are a really big deal abroad uh, in a way that the elections of countries that aren't close by usually, usually aren't. Um, yeah. I remember going to bed, uh, in London early in the morning after Gore won Florida, yeah. um, to wake up to a different world. And I remember also I was in Paris for the 2004 election um, oh, wow. and the streets were packed, man. Like people were out and yeah, it was, it was an important event and I can only imagine what, and that, that you know, that was kind of, that was under very different circumstances. Let's put it this way. Put it that way. Yeah. Uh, and I can only imagine what it must have been like to have been abroad around that time. It was. Just it was that. again. Most of again I, up until the last two years, if you had asked me, I would have said that most of Western Europe, most of Canada, most of South America, most of Asia, their their left of center people were way, way, way left of center relative to somebody in the United States. Right. Um, and then the, even the conservatives in like a Canadian conservative is pretty and, and less, you know, same thing for the UK. It used to be true, at least that uh, a right of center, somebody would would still be left of, of center relative to the United States politicians. But now the last couple of years have changed, uh, changed all that, hasn't it? You've seen the um, you've seen what's happened in Hungary. You've seen what's happened in uh, Turkey. You've seen what's happened in Poland. You've seen what almost happened in in France, when you know uh, they, they, there was um, uh, I I issues with the uh, with Emmanuel Macron's email, 
right? You'll, you'll recall that. Uh, you'll, uh, what else? Brexit, of course, that, that's pretty famous. Uh, Italy, oh my goodness, Italy. Um, Rodrigo, Rodrigo Duterte taking over, taking power in the Philippines. I mean, what a crazy few years it's been. So I, I no longer know where people, where I expect people generally line up. But uh, yeah. it's not where I am. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks, thanks for thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, just just to close that off, in particular, I've, I've interviewed quite a few people uh, in Europe about you know this this these issues come up in particular with respect actually to conference organizing and people who are frequent speakers because people who are organized accustomed to organizing conferences in the UK are, are curious about what impact Brexit might have on um, travel there. By oh dear! From other European countries and 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 things like that, and so one just bit of scuttlebutt that I believe I heard was that tech conferences are being more are more likely to be staged in Europe proper now rather than the United Kingdom. That wouldn't surprise me, um, and it's it's so it's interesting. I I think the European Union one of the sort of benefits of that was that it was there was less friction to just going to your next door neighbor state and going to a conference, you know, but, uh, I don't remember people like if you ask somebody in the United States to fly to the other side of the continent, that was, that's very, it's very unlikely, you know? Um, but they will do it. It's not, it's, it's, there's no reason not to do it. It's the, it's as easy as it can be. Right. And with the European union, you have that, you have basically the same benefit there. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know if getting rid of that friction or, or rather if increasing friction there, if making it harder for people to, to, to move from one place to another will foster a movement of people to the, those other places to participate in conferences or if they'll just end up isolating the English. I don't know. I have no idea. They, it's just a very scary thought. Yeah. Yeah. One of the, for me, I work in the Java community, the J JVM community. And uh, in the UK, you've got, it's a it's a part of the financial center, right? It's a financial center around the world. And so some of the most interesting tech, you know, going back to this idea of like Silicon Valley is not the only place where interesting things are being done. Some of the most interesting stuff technolo technologically is being done right there in London, right? And in, in, in the UK in general. But London is just amazing. You can't believe all the people doing amazing things, high-speed trading, you know, uh, machine learning and analytics, big, you know, high-scale web apps, just incredible stuff, all born of this need to be able to, be a better uh, financial center, right? And I'd hate for that to, I'd hate for that that vibrancy to be, you know, diminished in any way because of uh, things that are essentially not related to what they're doing. Yeah, I can't, I can't help but agree. I, I, people who listen to this podcast will know what I'm about to say, but I used to be an investment banker in London myself, um, and, oh, yeah. and uh, you know, I, I thrived there in ways that I never could in Canada. Yeah. And, you know, to see all kinds of things threatened by what I mean, if you're on the side of things where it's it's a ridiculous mistake to contemplate, not just the ridiculous mistake, but also the consequences is, is quite depressing. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned uh, being part of the Java community. And uh, so I guess that's a good opportunity to segue into the next part of the interview where we talk about oh, okay. your work. Um, so you are a developer advocate for Spring. Yes, sir. I was, I'm wondering, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit first about what, what a developer advocate is for those listening who might not know. Uh, well, I am a developer. So I do, I'm, a, I'm a developer advocate for the technology called Spring. Uh, in my capacity, I do my level-headed best to bring uh, feedback from the community to the engineering group. I advocate uh, for them to the engineering team. And, uh, and then vice versa, I advocate uh, for the engineering group to the community. I try and bring uh, what we are doing, what we are working on, uh, the latest and greatest, uh, to the community. And how I do that is sort of how anybody would do that is sort of up in the air, right? You can, you can write blogs, you can do podcasts, you can do videos, you can speak at conferences, you can write articles, you can write books. Me, I try and do all of that. And uh, there's other ways to get the job done, I suppose. I, I know some people who, are, who do a very effective job just writing blogs. Never leave home, never get on a plane. That's fine. Well, it's fine. I know a lot of people who are just amazing webinar runners. They just do amazing webinars every every few days, every week or whatever. And they just, uh, you know, that's their entire vehicle. I don't know, whatever. Um, 
but I, I just try and do a little bit of everything. So I've got a podcast, I've got a screencast, I've got a weekly blog. All this stuff is weekly. I've got a blog I do every week. I've got books, seven books now, or sorry, six books I've got, I'm working on now. Uh, I also work on the, work on the projects. I work on the code feedback to the engineering group. So, you know, it's and a, and a developer advocate is ideally somebody that can help connect the community with technology uh, and make it so that the community wants to uh, uh, connect to that technology. And the, and the thing is people don't trust code, right? They don't trust software. It's, it's cold, it's sterile, it's clinical. Uh, people trust other people. So hopefully I can be the, the, the friendly face that helps them find a way to a solution. Um, and because I don't, because I'm not a salesperson and because I'm not, I have no vested interest in promulgating this technology on, on somebody uh, beyond, I mean, I get paid one way or another, right? So I, I have no sort of uh, vested interest in that, right? Um, uh, and so because of that, I'm, I'm very happy to, I think people are happy to talk to me and I'm certainly very, very happy to talk to them. Uh, and see if I can sort them sort them out if they have questions, you know that kind of thing. So um, I don't know. I don't know. Hard to. It's hard to give a good answer. I'm. I'm. And I should. I should know better too. I think that was a pretty good answer. I. I, I sprung it on. I sprung it on Josh for those listening. He didn't know I was going to ask him about that. Um, but I didn't know any of these. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, none of them. None of them. We did. We talk about in advance. But um, uh, yeah, my my understanding of it, and and just you know, for the record, I'm a, I'm I'm in and around sort of tech all the time, but I'm not a technical person myself. And I've, I've interviewed one or two other people who are advocates on the podcast. And my understanding is that you've got something in this case, Spring, like a framework uh, that a team of people have developed and are developing, and you want someone to go out there and tell people what the benefits are of using it. And then yep. very importantly, though, you want someone bringing the message back the other way from people who are using it to the team that actually builds and maintains the framework right so they understand so it's actually really important i think you use the word bridge but it's like it's that's a very important metaphor there's there's messaging there's talking going both ways and having someone who understands the interests on both sides uh is really important yeah exactly yeah i i i'm i'm at my best when people can that when they feel like they can talk to me so my twitter is my direct messages are wide open my email is josh at joshlong.com i you know if you're using spring and you've got questions or if there's something we can do to help let us know and so Let on, me know. On that note, thank, th thanks for that. On that, on that note, um, what what is Spring? Ah, the uh, so this one's even harder to answer. Spring is a software framework uh, built on Java, but it it serves uh, any number of different languages on the JVM, including uh, Groovy, uh, Kotlin, Scala, uh, etc., and Java. And uh, it's a framework. So a framework is a it's a thing uh, that calls your code instead of you calling it. So basically. Uh, you write your code in terms of this framework. You write the minimum required to satisfy the uh, the thing that needs to be expressed in terms of the framework. And uh, because it's the thing that actually stands up your code and and assembles the sort of running application out of the bits that you plug into it, because it has that sort of bird's eye view of every moving piece in the system, it can do things for you. And so that's the foundational piece. We call that that we call that mechanism that that the arrangement I just described, where the framework actually stands up your code, your objects, your code, your classes, and, uh, and, and puts them into motion, that, that framework uh, is doing so through a pattern called inversion of control. And uh, inversion of control in turn promotes um, uh, better code. It promotes object-oriented code where you have a nice clean encapsulation of ideas. Uh, and so that in turn promotes testability. So Spring at its core is this thing that hopefully produces better code. It results in less code and better code. That is the foundational piece, and on top of that, we have a number. Just a, uh, uh, we, you know, we we run the gamut of of uh, technologies that you can build on top of that 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 serve particular verticals, right? So if you want to do integration, we have a technology called Spring Integration. If you want to do security, we have a product called Spring Security. If you want to do, uh, uh, if you want to talk to NoSQL data stores, we have a product called Spring Data. If you want to um, do batch processing, we have a product called Spring Batch. And if you want to do, if you want to build web apps, we we have a a product called Spring Web Flux, uh, Flux, F L U X. Uh, if you want to, um, well, I don't know. It's ever important to be clear about that. Um, uh, if you want to build, uh, you know, any uh, any kind of application, there there might be a framework you can, you can use, and these things congeal nicely if you know how to do that. But a lot of people don't want to have to play the role of gluing these things together. So we have a project called Spring Boot. Now Spring Boot 
uh, is a opinionated take on the Java ecosystem. It allows you to to uh, take the idea of a framework even further. And you, at this point, you're writing just the absolute bare minimum, uh, the actual the actual sort of business logic, the differentiating business logic, and then Spring Boot uh, helps you sort of configure all the rest of this stuff, right? And um, this is proven very productive. So Spring Boot is really what's, you know, these days I think most people, the vehicle by which people consume Spring is through Spring Boot, which sits on top of all those projects, starting with Spring at the very foundation and, and working its way up. And so Spring Boot is the, um, it's sort of an opinionated approach. It's like Ruby on Rails, but instead of just being limited to web apps babysitting databases, we can also support microservices and messaging and integration and Kafka and RabbitMQ and web services and security and everything else, right? It's not just a web app babysitting a database. Yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that some great explanation. Um, you reminded me you've got a great passage in your book where you sort of set the context very well, well where you talk about Ruby on Rails. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little, I'll, I'll quote you back at yourself uh, and then oh ask you if you could uh, maybe explain because it, it not only will give people an, an idea of you know the actual history that we find ourselves in right now, how things are changing, but but how important these platforms are and what they do. So if you could, so here's the quote. Now closer to 2020 than 2000, Ruby on Rails is optimized for the wrong thing. Most applications are not web applications babysitting a database anymore. They're client service-based architectures, end quote. So yeah. could, you, could you talk a little bit about what Ruby on Rails is and why it was so important when it came out at the time and why, why you're saying it's optimized for the wrong thing now, given how things have changed in the last 15 or so years? So the original use case for Ruby on Rails was uh, that if you're trying to build an application, a web application that talks to a database, then you're building an application that uh, has a form. You have forms, you have user interface elements, you have layouts, you have templated layouts. These and these things have business logic that that, that uh, you invoke by posting, or rather, you the browser sends a request to the server um, by triggering a page refresh. Refresh, right? And uh, that was the very very beginning. That was like 2004, 2005. And uh, the response would come back, and the page would become uh, would be re-rendered, right, with a new state of the page. And and this was right before the sort of very dynamic behavior that Google, I think, first sort of uh, made made famous uh, with uh, with AJAX, right? With AJAX, you have this uh, this this convention or this uh, it was a bit of a hack, if you if I will, but it, but it worked. What they did was they found a way to send data to the server without actually triggering a page refresh, right? And you can do it through, through JavaScript. So suddenly I can have the page, I can leave the page alone. The page wouldn't flicker, it wouldn't change, it wouldn't refresh. But behind the scenes, when the page is moving, when the page is loaded, there's logic that's talking to your, your server, right? So suddenly you've got a client, which is a HTML5, or sorry, HTML and JavaScript-based client application running in the browser, and then there's a server, which is the API to which the client made requests. Uh, and this is different because you're not you're not rendering the user interface necessarily from the server. The, the the user interface is now updating on its own based on data it's getting by making connections to that server. Um, and so, really, a lot of the original work that was done in, in Ruby and Rails was I want to do all of the logic in the uh, in the server including the rendering of the page itself, the template, the markup, all that stuff. And as we've moved more and more from that model, where now we have eight data APIs, we're actually just talking to APIs that have, that are, you know, we talk about REST, right? RESTful APIs. These things uh, give us access to data. We encode that data as JSON or XML. Uh, hopefully we're using something like hypermedia. Uh, and the data comes back and the client then uses that data to then redraw the page, but we're not actually refreshing the browser page itself. We're just using JavaScript to update it in place. And, and now we also have Android and we have iOS and we have smart TVs and Roku's and Xboxes and, uh, you know, your Tesla and Ford cars and GM cars. These all, everything has an SDK, right? Your video game console, all these different things uh, have a software development kit that you can use. Uh, and these things are also in turn, not, you know, refreshing themselves based on, some sort of user interface that they downloaded on first view. They're instead loading the user interface and then subsequent calls are just going back to the server. Um, and so this is very much a client server architecture. So we don't have 
one user interface anymore. It's no longer uh, it's no longer sufficient to say that I have just a desktop based browser for my uh, my interactions over the web. Everything is on the web, and so Ruby and Rails really it, it wasn't built for HTTP APIs. It was built for HTTP pages, you know, user interfaces. Um, it's gotten much better, to be clear, but a lot of the magic that it did in the very beginning, a lot of the things that, a lot of the assumptions, the uh, optimizations that it made possible in the very beginning that allowed it to be so phenomenal uh, as a way of getting an idea from concept all the way to, to customer very, very quickly, those assumptions don't quite hold up in this new world. So a lot of people that used uh, Ruby and Rails are moving to things like, or they moved rather years ago to things like Sinatra, which is just a, a REST API, right? And so you can have Sinatra just by itself, maybe you have an ORM of some sort, and um, you know people are stripping down all of the machinery that Ruby and Rails gave you. And, it, and while you can do REST APIs with Ruby and Rails, it feels a bit heavy to have all that extra stuff as well, right? Which, which is no longer needed. Your book is called Reactive Spring, uh, and I wanted yes, to give you an opportunity to explain to those who might not know what reactive programming is. Ah, a new, it's a new solution for an old problem. So... Uh, as we've moved increasingly to sort of um, to this client server sort of world, uh, and as more and more data is being conducted over the network, we see that people are being increasingly confronted with uh, more requests to their servers. And uh, the result of that is that you've got bytes being conducted over the network. So the, the way we do input and output traditionally on the JVM uh, is, is synchronous, it's blocking, right? So what that means is, suppose I want to read data from a file, uh, the traditional approach, the one most of us, I'm sure, were taught in school, uh, is you sit there, you ask for a input stream to give you the bytes from a file. As the bytes come in, you process them. But while you're waiting for the bytes to arrive, you're sitting there on the thread on which that re request was made, waiting for the bytes to come back. As they arrive, you process them, more come, you process them, but you're sitting there on that thread. The problem with this is that not all things are files on the local SSD file system. Some things are data being sent over the wire over the network from far away. There, there's, you know, there might be a failure downstream. There might be whatever. And the result is that you can't assume that those bytes are going to be there instantaneously. And so we have the situation where uh, we are sitting on threads, blocking those threads, basically, waiting for act actions to happen, waiting for data to arrive, and not doing anything in the meantime. And if threads were cheap, if they were free on platforms like the JVM, uh, then this would not be... Uh, such a big problem. But in point of fact, they are very expensive on the JVM. And they're expensive on a lot of platforms, actually, because any platform that has native operating system threads will face this issue. So reactive programming is a a, uh, a way to design software that um, doesn't block, that allows you to think about data in terms of streams of data. Uh, and um, it's these are asynchronous streams of data. So you can say, hey, this data is not here right now. But I can hold on to this thing, and I'll get a reference to I'll get that data when it's available. I'll be given a callback. Um, and when you move to that approach, when you move to that callback-centric approach, the result is that you can say, hey, I want that data, and then get off the thread immediately. But as soon as you're off that thread, you're now waiting uh, for that data to arrive. You're not sitting there blocking, though. You're just expecting a callback at some point in the future. But the natural result of that is that you get lots of callbacks. And so callback-centric code can be very, very uh, tedious to kind of untangle if, if you've ever done uh, sort of JavaScript Node.js programming circa 2010, uh, that can be very tedious. So um, reactive programming is a way of working with asynchronous streams of data while not while avoiding some of that complexity, that sort of intrinsic complexity. Uh, it gives you a standard way of describing that kind of data, and it gives you operators for working with that kind of data to filter, to, to flat map, to do this kind of thing. Um, and because it's asynchronous, it maps nicely to uh, asynchronous I.O., which in turn gives us this opportunity to not stick around and, and monopolize threads that don't need to be monopolized, right? We can get off those threads and allow somebody else in the system to reuse them. Moving on to the it, last part of it the you, Oh, unless you want to continue. One last thing. Oh. It gives you better scale. It allows you to do more with the same hardware. Per transaction, it might be a little bit slower than synchronous blocking non-reactive code, but you can handle a good deal many more users per computer, basically. And so the result of that is that either you can handle more users or you can you know, reduce your data center bill. You can reduce the number of servers to handle the same number of users. So you've written uh, a lot of books. 
or, mm -hmm. or co-written, um, and you've produced a lot of content uh, in video form yeah. as well. So I wanted to ask you, uh, how did you get your, how did you get into the project of your first book? Ooh, um, I, so most of my life has just been really good luck. I, I like anybody who says that uh, software is skill and whatever, that's just nonsense. It's luck. Um, so the first book, how'd that go? I, I, what happened? I spoke at some Java user groups about a topic. And then I wrote eventually for a, a portal, a, a web portal called the server Uh, that was, that used to be a fairly, fairly active, uh, you know, gathering hole for, for people in the Java community, gathering place, watering, watering hole. Uh, and, um, that led to me being invited to speak at a little Java conference there that they had called the Server Side Java Symposium TSSJS, and then from there, um, I got invited to you know because I was on that list of this fairly visible, fairly popular conference. Um, more things happened, so then eventually somebody asked me if I wanted to uh, speak internationally. I was like, oh well, yeah, could do. So I, I went and spoke internationally. And eventually that gives me more visibility. And somebody finally came to me and said, hey, we see that you're doing this stuff with Spring in the ecosystem. And there's this legendary book by this guy named Gary Mack, who's in uh, Macau in China. Uh, and Gary wrote this book, which is just a fan favorite and people love it. Um, but he needs to step back a little bit. Uh, and uh, we're looking for someone to to uh, take the reins. Would you be interested? And I, uh, I, I am uh, I'm an idiot. Right. Let's be very clear about that. So, so I said, yes. Um, now Gary did a very, very good job and, uh, and I did, well, I did something, right. I did, I finished the book. Uh, it's, uh, um, I did my best. I did, re I really did my best and it was a, it was a, I think the result was okay. Actually it was great, but, um, uh, you know, I, I, it was my, it was my first, uh, well, actually, no, that's not true. I, that was the second book. That was his book called Spring Recipes. But before that, somebody somebody reached out to me and asked me if I want, wouldn't mind writing another book, and and so I did it with I did it in cooperation with him. So this guy, this poor Gary, he was he's the greatest, uh, just absolutely great. He indulged, he let me write this book, uh, and we worked on it, and uh, it was a it was a book about um, it was a book about. Like, wouldn't it be great if we had a way to talk about the recipes that you could use to uh, handle these sort of different use cases that go above and beyond what you would see in most books, right? So it was really a lot of like, I don't know, it was sort of like in-depth nerd wish fulfillment for me, right? Like, I wish somebody would talk about uh, spring integration, which at the time was fairly new and nobody was really, there was no book on there out, out on it yet. I want to, I wish somebody would talk about batch processing and big data and data grids, all these things that you could do with spring in time, but for which there had not yet been really sort of uh, interesting coverage, right? Certainly nothing on, on, in the order of a chapter or two uh, for each of these topics. So I said, what about a book that just assembled all these kinds of things together? And so we wrote that book and that was, um, like I said, that was okay. Uh, that one, I, I'm very proud of it, but it was, uh, um, it was definitely my first attempt. And then the second book, at that point, Gary, uh, ever the gentleman, ever the, uh, the, uh, the patient type. And he'd mentored me, right? He was, he was very kind and very happy to answer questions and all that stuff. Uh, he let me take the helm of his big book, Spring Recipes. And, um, and that book that came out, you know, again, again, because we had such a solid foundation because he was such a, he did such a good job on that first edition. There was just so much there to work with. And all I had to do was update it and add a few hundred pages and, uh, and the book was great. I think not in any, not in any, any part because of what I did, but you know, it came out very nicely and, um, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that story. Um, it reminds me of one or two other people I've interviewed who say, uh, to, you know, people who are young, young developers, people starting their careers, uh, get yourself out there. Uh, yeah. if this is the kind, if, if the kind of stuff that Josh does sounds like the kind of stuff that you'd like to do, get yourself out there, go to meetups. Give little talks. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't matter where you start. You have to start somewhere. And remember, if I can do it, you can definitely do it. <laughs> Truly. Um, speaking of, and things, I'm happy to help too. Speaking of things that you do, um, uh, you've also made made videos, and in, including uh, a series, I believe, for O'Reilly that's on Safari. 
Is that right? Oh, one or two. Yeah, I've got, um, let me see. So first things first, before I start selling stuff, you can go to, you can go to bit.ly forward slash spring hyphen tips hyphen playlist. And there I do a screencast every Wednesday where it's just me at a keyboard for 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes looking at one aspect of the ecosystem, one corner of the ecosystem. And it's just, I, I'm at this point, I'm fairly well known for doing just all live, live coding demos. I don't, I don't do slides uh, most of the time just because I, I feel like if you're going to show software, then just show software, right? Right. Why bother? Why bother with the extra indirectional sort of hop between the, the, the listener and the concept with a slide, right? Um, and so, so I do these live screencasts and, uh, they're on YouTube and I do them every Wednesday and I hope people will consume them. There's, there's gotta be 60 or something like that already. Right. Um, but I also do these longer in depth, uh, longer sort of, you know, not what's what's a good word, longer sort of, uh, classes, if you will. Right. And these are, these are on uh, peer, uh there's a, these are on safari there's like six of them seven of them i don't know eight of them something like that there's a lot of them now on all sorts of different topics and these tend to be far longer they tend to be four or five six seven eight hours and uh the latest and greatest of which is uh one with uh rob winch the lead of spring security introducing guess what spring security uh and that's a, you know security is super important if you want if you care about application security you should use spring security it is the most widely used security technology on the jvm uh, by far, it's been used by more applications than anything else to secure those applications. So, yeah, please check that out. Um, there's all sorts of other. There's a whole bunch of them. And if you have a if you have a Safari uh, subscription, it's like Netflix. You get a, a it's an all you can eat buffet style subscription for technical content. If you have that access, you can watch all eight of them or whatever it is, including Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, Microservices, all that stuff for no extra cost. Uh, and yeah, I've got I've got a, a sort of specific question about about that um, to ask yes, moment. But just but just before I do, I just want to reassure everyone listening to this podcast that in the transcription there will be links to everything that Josh Josh is talking about. Um, but the, the question I have is um, actually how is the soup made uh, when it comes to those those videos and the kind that I mean I know O'Reilly did a pivot a few years ago to you know focus on uh, I kept calling it a pivot they they started perhaps putting more focus than they had in the past on the creation of videos. Uh, yeah. What, what's it like? Do they, I mean, do they like, you know, does a helicopter arrive and fly you to Hollywood or like, you know, do you do it from home somewhere in between? Somewhere in between. I, so I work with my publisher is, uh, is Pearson, Addison Wesley. Right. And so I do the live lessons videos, but those that, that they, interestingly, they used to own part of the Safari online portal. Right. It's a technical marketplace like Netflix. And they used to own, they were co-owners of that with O'Reilly. I think at some point they sold it back to O'Reilly, but they still are one of the major producers of content on that channel, if you will, right? And so I, when I do my videos, I go into a studio uh, in San Francisco or in New York, or I guess there's one in London. I haven't done that one yet. Um, and I film and it's just me or my co-presenters. And a lot of times I do these with my co-presenter. I, I, I love to hang out with people on this on my team on the spring team, uh, and so I go into the studio with my with people I invite from the spring team to to do this with me. And it's just, usually it's just a it's just us in front of a hot green screen uh, for two or three days uh, filming. And you know, yes, you're sweat, yes, you're tired, but you get to hang out with people you like and and you learn from. And it's only three days, and uh, so yeah. It's a lot of fun, I guess is the answer. You mentioned your publisher, and one of the things I was looking forward to talking to you about was why you've decided to write your latest book on LeanPub. Ah, I had always wanted to. So I, we mentioned one book. I, I did a few books with A Press. I did a book with O'Reilly. Actually, I did two books with O'Reilly. So I, it's not like I haven't written a few books before. And uh, uh, it's not that I needed the leg up. It's not like nobody else would publish me. It's just, I wanted to have, I figured I, I had, this is my sixth book. So I figured I could take control of the process and, um, uh, I could be my own editor. I could, or I could, or I could manage that timeline myself. I wasn't under any, anybody else's, uh, uh, deadlines basically. And, um, I, I really wanted control over the, the feedback loop, right? So I, I'm a software engineer. I really like being able to 
uh, make a change, hit git push, see that change reflected almost immediately in the in continuous integration environment. And so LeanPub has two modalities. One is you can actually work with their sort of pre-canned publishing pipeline, which is fine. It's a, you basically work on a, was it Dropbox, I guess, or I guess you can do Git, Git repository as well. Either way, very, see, very, very interesting options, but what happens, what happens is that you make a change and then a few minutes, a few minutes later, whatever, almost as, as soon as possible, LeanPub uh, poops out a, um, a PDF and a EPUB and all that stuff for you. I don't know. I, I don't know what those options are. The other option is that you can bring your own assets. Uh, and, uh, and so that, in, in this case, LeanPub doesn't really care how you, um, you produce those artifacts, how you get a PDF or a Mobi or a Kindle or a, a, a you know, whatever. Um, and so I thought that was very interesting. I, I love ASCII doctor and ASCII doctor is completely programmable. So I, I've used ASCII doctor. I, I love writing books in ASCII doctor. It's just a very nice system. Plus my books tend to have lots of, um, code. So it's not like a, I'm not, it's not a storybook. I'm, I'm actually, it's a technical book where I'm including s snippets of code. So I need, I need to do pre-processing on the book before I can arrive at the final artifact, the final manuscript basically. And so having the ability to program that pipeline and then just have that generate a PDF and an EPUB and a Kindle and a Mobi and all that stuff, which I can then periodically log into LeanPub and then upload as my latest updates. That automatically happens though. It generates all that stuff every single time I do a Git push. Um, and uh, the, the result is that it's just sort of, I get instant feedback. I can run my tests before I publish the book. I can make sure that the, the quality of the code is up to snuff. You know, it's all the stuff that, you know, I'm, a, I'm able to write a book like I write software iteratively and I get fast feedback. And, uh, you know, I, I don't expect that everybody will want to exert full control over this part of the life cycle. But if you're a technical publisher, I think you might. And I actually ended up writing a lot of software for this process uh, based on the amazing ASCII Doctor project. Uh, and thanks in no small part to... Uh, Dan Allen and the people over there who are working on this stuff. And so as a result, I actually have um, software that I use that is open source. And if you'll indulge me, I'll share it with your listeners that they can use to then um, publish their own book, okay, so if they want, if they want to exert more control over this, if they're programmers. The, part, the process you've got is great. It's already very good. I'm not trying to discourage that. Um, let's see here. Publication. Uh, da, 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 da. Where is that? I think it's this. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. T. Yeah. I've got, so if you go to my github.com forward slash reactive hyphen spring hyphen book forward slash um, publication, I think. And there you'll find a, a Maven project and that Maven project, it's open source. You can, you can throw away my Travis build and uh, uh, you'll, you know, I won't explain it to you all right now, but the point is it's, it'll actually, if you run that process, it'll generate the, um, the artifacts for you. If you give it, the, if you comply with the project, I'll make sure there's documentation in place by the time any of your readers find it. Thanks very much for sharing that. And, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we love hearing directly from authors about, uh, the sort of systems and processes they've set up and our, our authors love hearing from other authors about their, their innovations and their approaches as well. Just to explain very, very briefly, uh, yeah, LeanPub has a number of different writing modes directed at different types of people. You know, we've got one for writing genre fiction. So it's just in the browser, basically WYSIWYG. Then we've got Google docs. So you can write in Google docs if you're familiar with that and you love using all their collaboration features and all that kind of stuff. And then the sort of canonical thing is writing in plain text in Dropbox or Bitbucket or GitHub. But as you could tell from Josh's uh, impassioned description of his workflow that he built himself, um, a lot of authors have their own way of doing things. And, you know, so we built something called bring your own book mode, which is what Josh is using, which means you just upload PDF, EPUB or Mobi files to LeanPub and they're instantly published and available to all your existing and future readers. So there's no friction when it comes to uh, updating your book. And, right, and, and I love that. And we, yeah, and we want to respect the fact that, like, we're we're opinionated. We understand so we're, basically every good book author is opinionated too, and uh, and so we, we we sort of like you know it was funny because it's like all the, the ultimately the, to to satisfy the most sophisticated users, we built the simplest feature, which is like drag and drop a file. Uh, love it. But but there you go. Um, and so 
however, of course, when it comes to uh, pub- publishing in progress, we've got all kinds of other features. And you've decided to publish this book while it's in progress and start. You, yeah. You've, you've published it before it was finished, and there's you no know, sections marked to do. And you've got your email address in the book saying, you know, email me with feedback. How have you? What's that experience been like you for you so far? Was it something you were excited to try or scared to try? I was excited because I mean, for, well, first of all, it's. Um, a lot of a lot of your a lot of the other publishers out there want to get early feedback, right? They want to get people excited about the book, and so I didn't think this was. I I love the way that Lean Pub does it, but it's not unique to Lean Pub to to want to get feedback, uh, and to want to get people excited about the book. So I I knew that that was something I wanted, but the fact that I can sort of go out there and have something out there that people can try, and it's just built into the platform. People expect to feedback to that, right? The whole point of Lean Pub is that you have this iterative process, and you can. You can sort of get it out there. And, it, and for me, it's really because there's no – like the only person I signed a contract with is, is myself, right? I, I told myself I want to finish this book. But if if it doesn't happen, then you know nothing ventured, nothing gained, I guess. But, but it will happen, right? But it, you don't know if it's worth doing until you've gotten it out there. And with most publishers, there's no sort of like – there's no direct feedback. There's no like validation of what you've done until months later. You don't know, right? Well, this, you put it out there and people start buying it immediately. There's just this, this tsunami of people that are just, oh, that sounds great. I'll, 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 you know, I'll have that. So uh, just getting that val- you know, validation is great. And, and because it's an iterative platform, I'm, I'm, the thing I'm talking about in this book is changing. Right? I can't hope – I'm going to have to – at some point, I'm going to have to pin it down and say this is 1.0 and I'll work on 1.1 next. But, you know. Right now, it's changing fast enough that I'd like to be able to get it out there and get people excited about it, knowing that I might have to change it uh, soon. So LeanPub is really great for that sort of agile, iterative process. I love that. It's really interesting. You touched on something there that's kind of not we – don't, we don't really talk about it too much. but And it wasn't necessarily something that we were like – that was really kind of top of mind when LeanPub was created. But one of the biggest problems that writers have is motivation and not desire. There's all kinds of desire to have the book done and get that Nobel Prize. But actually sitting <laughs> down and you know typing it out uh, isn't always that easy. And actually – this this process of publishing a book before it's finished turns out to be pretty magical for getting that motivation for at least yeah. a few authors because you've got somebody who's like, hey, I found a typo on page five. You can fix it by the time you reply to them. Uh, right. And then they're like, oh, and by the way, that section that you haven't finished yet, when's that going to be done? I can't wait. You know, you know, yeah. you know you're getting positive feedback and you know there's someone out there who, who has a genuine, not just desire, but, like, well, um, but need for what you're writing. And when you know that, uh, it changes right. your attitude towards like, you know, well, you know, what should I do? Should I, should I do some more Twitter for the next half hour? Or should I maybe bang out that section? And if you know yeah. that there's someone out there waiting for it, it can really make a difference. And that's, and that, actually that's a great point. I can solve, even though the book isn't done, I can solve the problem that somebody else is having right now. Or I can like, they may just need that one chapter. They would, they, they're willing to buy the book for that one section that is novel to them, that, that teaches that illuminates something they didn't otherwise understand. And so, and the other thing is, people ask me, "Is this book going to cover X, Y, or Z?" And on Twitter or other channels, and I and I say, "You know what? I wasn't planning on it, but it seems like there's a, a common enough interest that I'd love to do that." So I I have the benefit of being able to market these things myself. That's the other thing that I think is really great about this is I, I spend, just, you know, thousands of hours in front of audiences all around the world every year, and so the first thing I do in what in all my presentations is I talk about this book I'm writing called Reactive Spring, right, and. Uh, so you know, people people go to the URL and they buy the book and whatever, and they know it's coming and they're, they're they bookmarked it. And people ask me about it on Twitter. It's got its own Twitter handle at, at Reactive Spring. So you, as long as you're willing to sort of put, as long as you're willing to open the door, people will go through it, right? They want to they want to talk to you as much as you want to talk to them, and uh, that's great. It yeah. feels great. Yeah. The other the other the other thing the, 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 I can't I can't. But just before I move on to the last question that I always ask in this podcast, I did <laughs> mention that um, actually people find this a little bit surprising when we say it. But another thing that can happen when you launch a book after you've say written you know twenty percent of it is is nothing yep. at all. And one of the secrets, I mean, I, by which I mean no one cares because you've you you've written something that might be excellent, but just no one happens to be interested in. And in the conventional publishing process, that means years of your life have gone by. 
potential right. before you realize there's just no there might be a, an interest in something else I could have written there's just no interest in this particular subject that I chose to write about and the way I chose to frame it and so one of the biggest successes in a lean pub book is when someone stops writing it when they otherwise would have spent made like literally maybe years working on something that was bound to not really achieve the goals that they were aiming for um yeah so don't so if, if you if you decide to self-publish a book and you drop it and it turns out there's really not that much interest that that's actually a if, if you've if you've published early that's actually in there's a there's a silver lining to that cloud a very serious one as well the last question i always like to ask is if there was one thing on lean pub that we could build for you or one thing we could fix for you can you think of anything you would ask us to do uh can you hear me yep yeah uh you know i'm not sure let me think about that i i i can't think of anything because again i've you let me solve the problem. I was able to scratch my own itch. I'm a software engineer. I was able to scratch that itch. And your platform let me do that, right? That's that's one of the things I really wanted was the ability to have input into that. So I don't – the the thing I would like to solve is the production pipeline, right? Uh, and, and you did it for me. The other thing – there's other things that I really appreciate, like the very generous royalties uh, for use of your platform. That's appreciated, obviously. The um, – the fact that I retain the rights to the book so I can publish it on, you know, I can distribute it through other things as well. I'm not foreclosing on that opportunity. So I, I don't really, I can't think of, uh, hmm, let me think about that. I don't even know. What's, what do you think? What is it? What is the thing that other people say? I wonder. What, what does, what, what do other people say? Um, uh, yeah. usually it's, usually it's, um, it's often quite, quite specific. I mean, actually it's probably the most common answer is, Hmm, I can't really think of anything right now because everything just kind of worked. And that's not me boasting like that, that actually like, I mean, lean has been around for years and we listen very closely to the needs of authors. And so for, if you're, unless you're doing something unique to your project that hasn't come up for us before, things will probably yeah. work smoothly. Um, but um, actually, uh, collaboration uh, is something that comes up a lot. I see. Uh, as you said, you know, the sort of raison d'etre for LeanPub is to help authors get feedback early. And there's a great deal more that we could do around that. And, you know, sort of like, you know, from, you know, just like, say, interacting in the LeanPub kind of website or app itself, you know, you can imagine various communication channels or change logs you could have or, or um, sort of people submitting requests for changes there in a more formal and structured way um, and readers yeah. and readers interacting with readers as well is another thing. So the, the building, building that community kind of stuff is just this whole dimension of lean pub that is, um, you know, almost, you know, th there, there's a foundation there, but there's a great deal that we could build. And that's something that does come up pretty, pretty well, clearly. And I look forward to trying it. Obviously I'm a big fan. Okay, great. Well, thank, thank you very much, Josh, for taking uh, the time out, uh, today to talk to me and uh, to all of our listeners and thank you for being a lean pub author it is my pleasure thanks so much for having me and thanks for the great conversation thanks a lot and thanks as always to all of you for listening to this episode of the front matter podcast if you like what you heard please rate and review it wherever you found it particularly itunes is helpful for us and if you'd like to be a lean pub author yourself please visit our website at leanpub.com thanks